Thank oh you for God. tuning in. Welcome to Guy Ichison's Reinventing the Tattoo Community, a place for tattooers, apprentices, collectors, and the curious to unite under all things art and tattoos. We encourage you to join in these live streams and real world events where we offer a new option for connecting with each other to better your art, develop your skill set, and be with other like minded artists. If you're new to our community, you can find us beaming out nearly every day. We've evolved into a quality network of amazing live and on-demand tattoo and art shows that are expanding all the time. Thank you to everyone joining us on YouTube or Facebook, and a special thanks to the, those of you who are listening to the podcast. Our event schedule and notifications can be found in our official Reinventing the Tattoo community. To get there, search for and download the Reinventing the Tattoo app that is found on both of your app stores, Apple and Google Play. You can also join directly at community.reinventingthetattoo.com. All of our network shows, art jams, drawing groups, interviews, panels, webinars can be enjoyed on demand and are stored in our library, as well as the YouTube and podcast channels. There you'll find countless tattoo and art rabbit holes, perfect for the front room of your studio or to entertain tattoo clients. In fact, we're beaming out four channels 24-7. If you go to reinventing247.com, you can see all of this and enter to win a goodie bag with samples from Cheyenne Cartridges, Raw Pigments, and d -Lies Pro. We also have several weekly shows and drawing groups, too. Every Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m., you can join Jason Lesser for his Reinventing Drawing Group. All skill levels are welcome. At 9 p.m. on Sundays, you can watch the Tattoo Weekly with myself, Gabe Ripley, and Jake Meeks of our affiliate Fireside Tattoo. Every Monday evening, we have our evening canon class with subscribers led by Guy Aitchison. Mm. This month, we are focusing on anatomy. <laughs> to join, subscribe to the canon at courses.reinventingthetattoo.com. Every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., we have Ricardo Sturdivant for his Reinventing Drawing Group. <laughs> Wednesdays at noon, you can find the Tattoo Now show hosted by Gabe Ripley. Every Thursday afternoon, you can find the Tattoo Collecting Podcast hosted by Fawn Baker and Jordan Rookus. And on Thursday mornings, subscribers are welcome to join Cure for a, uh, skill levels that are focused on apprentices, fundamentals, and such. Now, there are several ways to support our show, and that is by checking out some of our upcoming pro development and on-demand shows. We've got stuff from Andre Malcolm, BJ Betts, Bob Tyrell, and others. Find all of this at courses.reinventingthetattoo.com. Of course, we mentioned this being a free community, and we want to say thank you to all of our sponsors for making that happen for us. We recommend checking out World Tattoo Events at worldtattooevents.com. They are the largest, most comprehensive resource for tattoo events worldwide. Lots of stuff is updating as conventions are rescheduling like crazy, so definitely remember to check them out. This country, Russia. We also have Inkjet Stencils, found at inkjetstencils.com. Now print stencils from your mobile or computer. Save your time, hands, and apprentices' hands. Webinars and free samples are located on their website. We've also got Raw Pigments, an ink company that is tapping into the source with acrylic-free pigments that have really been impressing artists across the globe. You can find out more about them at rawpigments.co. We also have d -Lies Pro known internationally as Dermalize Pro. Protect your art. If you're using Saran Wrap, watch videos of tattooers to see what it's all about at DermalizePro.com. Also, thank you to Tattoo Now, which is tattoo technology for tattooers. And of course, the founder and inspiration behind Reinventing the Tattoo, Guy Aitchison. You can find his biomech encyclopedia, DVDs, machines, paintings, and more at GuyHSN.com. We also want to say thank you to our affiliate Fireside Tattoo Network, the Apprenticeship Diaries, and EcoFriendlyTattooSupplies.com. Now I know it's cool seeing us on the screen, but there of course are real world events that are upcoming at the end of this year. October 3rd to 6th, the Paradise BYOB in Jiminy Peak, Massachusetts, will be webcasting shows live with tons of great content going on. As well as November 12th to 14th, you can find us in Belgium at the Brussels Tattoo Convention. Nick Baxter, Ivana, and Gabe will be doing seminars, beaming in an art jam, and a subscriber exclusive meetups, as well as general ones. Next May 20th to 22nd, you can find us in Hell City. 
July 8th to 10th, the Rock River Tattoo and Art Expo. There'll be a reinventing track artist, amazing venue. It's easy to get to from anywhere in the world. July 29th to 31st, 2022, the Rubber City Tattoo Invitational will be back with Tony Urbanic in Akron, Ohio. Now, if you guys missed that Paradise Tattoo Gathering, don't worry. Next October 20th to 23rd, the Paradise Tattoo Gathering will be back. Now, we welcome positive reviews on our channels and would love for you to follow us. But if you would like to host a reinventing event or to sponsor our community, just send us an email to management at reinventingthetattoo.com. Now, I'm going to get out of here. I will be in the background reading off comments. I'll have my browser open to share inspirations and references. Let me know where you're beaming in from. Thanks to our growing crew of contributing artists, truly helping reinventing reach more of the right people for the right reasons. Thank you for inspiring each other and everyone in our virtual reinventing offices. Hey, good morning, All right, everybody. Tony. Yeah. Oh. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you doing, Lauren? Greg, doing great. Doing well. Um, so if anybody missed, we will be taking questions on YouTube. Feel free to zoom in. We do have that link in our community at community.reinventingthetattoo.com. We'll also put it in the description for YouTube. Um, yeah, and we'd welcome to hear what you guys have to say. Good morning, everybody. I am Tony Urbanic, and I'm here with my favorite friend, Greg the Jacinto. Hi. We normally do a podcast once a month. We had uh, requests to do it more often because people were really enjoying the, uh, the interviews and the conversation and the stories and the tech tips and whatnot. So we figured we'd, uh, we'd change it up a little bit this time and delve out a little more information and open it up to people on YouTube, open it up to subscribers to come in and bs with us and ask questions about anything um greg and i have been building machines who knows how long at this point 40 something years plus together um greg y'all know who greg is so i don't really need to explain it um greg so i mean we're just going to talk machines it's just going to be me and greg whoever wants to jump in so you know, Greg, you, you got anything you want to start with before we start tearing into uh, this I mean, stuff? I mean, you were. Uh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, you were talking about Philadelphia Eddie with Lauren and I and pigments before we got into this. So, I mean. Oh, you, that old chestnut. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I met I met I met Eddie and Penny a long time ago. Uh, and Ed just like walked into the shop in Atlantic city, like smoking a joint right off the street. And oh my. <laughs> we all went to the Tropicana and had some drinks, had some laughs. It was, uh, got a little private area and stuff like that. This is like, I didn't know shit about tattooing. And, uh, I didn't really, I had a sense of like how important that guy was, but I didn't really know how important he was. Right. Uh, but yeah, that was it. That was like, that was basically it. It was, uh, it was what real- year was that about? Oh man, had to be like 98 or 99. Right. Yeah. Right on. Something like that. I don't know. The years. Yeah. I I met Eddie in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey at a, at a national, I think it was one of Dennis Dwyer's show, if I'm not mistaken. I worked with Winona Martin from uh, San Diego tattoo land. I guest spotted in her booth and, uh, who was he? there was a kid from jersey too but anyhow i remember seeing eddie in the magazines you know the old school tattoo magazines when we still that's all we had in the shop magazines where are those yeah right and uh magazines? i just remember i always seen him in that yellow blazer man holding holding a drink yeah and sure as shit the pompadour the yellow yeah and i was so intimidated it, like i couldn't like he walked up to Winona because, you know, of course, Winona knew him and he walked up, with her, up to her and he started bullshitting. And, I, you know, I was green. I was like, uh, shit, I was probably 21. I'm 51. So that's 30 years ago. And he was just such a presence. It was a, 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 it, it was amazing. Actually, I think that was his show, if, if I'm not mistaken. I, I could be wrong. I'd have to I have to dig back. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was like an older dude, but he was still like a big dude. 
Like, yeah. so I could see how he could be intimidating. But the thing about that, dude, he was like, like it instantly diffused because he was so nice. Like he yeah. just looked like everybody should be having a good time. He wasn't like a jerk at all. He was real cool. Uh, East coast, Charlie, who works at uh Philadelphia Eddie's on South street, one of the Philadelphia Eddie's, I think the one that Troy owns, he told me a story. I stopped in there for a visit a couple years ago and he told me a story how, uh, you know, Eddie would walk through the airport, whatever airport he was in. I don't, I'm not sure what airport it was, but he walked through the airport with a smoking section sign and he would have this sign and he would just put it up wherever he was standing and then start <laughs> smoking a cigarette. And like, I mean, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm severely paraphrasing this whole story because it's a, <laughs> it's a second or third hand story, but he right. would like smoke a cigarette and he said, the the crowd would gather around the sign where he was sitting there smoking and smoke cigarettes and then when he was done his cigarette he would simply take his sign down and walk away nice <laughs> like, it's very you like a, the scope of like you know like how cool that dude was you know yeah. and, and and again i didn't know him personally i've only met him a handful of times but uh and that's obviously a a, a story that you know, I didn't live, but uh, uh, East Coast Charlie, he told me that story and it was pretty cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, I remember the supply company too back in the day. Now, I dealt with National mainly when I started in the uh, in the 90s, late mm -hmm. 80s, early 90s. And we bought our uh, machine kits from them because we were poor. You know, we were scraping in the beginning and we bought powder pigments and we mixed our own pigments. And, uh, it seemed like National and, and Eddie's company were like parallel. And I didn't know about Eddie's company until a kid named Chris Henry started to work with me. And he was real big on it. And he turned me on to some of the different types of machines because I was just so narrow minded at that point. You know, it's early in my career, two, three years in. I didn't know much about anything. Right. And uh, yeah, those are, those are my early memories of united national, national national uh i could be wrong but i think national was owned by eddie at first and uh somehow uh something happened and he had to he left from there and started united right i never knew that yeah i, I remember think, talking to flo on the phone when i was a kid let's yeah i think flo is eddie's sister oh okay i did not know that yeah, yeah. we can get I, I mean somebody could somebody can confirm that story <laughs> like you know like or or not confirm it you know yeah, but uh, that's 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 what I heard. Yeah, I, I'm sitting here. It's funny. I just glanced over my national, my old national catalog sitting right here on my on my book on my bookshelf. Yeah, I, I actually have books. Yeah, I have books. You, too. you didn't get that. right? <laughs> books, man. Check them Check out. out dude. Oh, that's sick. That's there you sick. Go. I have a United catalog. I held on to everything. Like I, that's one thing is I am a pack rat, man. I'm going to try and figure out yeah, what year this is. I, I do have an original Mickey Sharps catalog, too, from 90. Oh, shit. I ordered, I ordered my Posi liner from them, and it's not listed in the catalog. Dude, Schwager pull, would love that thing. I'll pull that Posi liner out in a minute if you want to. Yeah, let's check it out. Shit. But uh, I'm trying to find a year on this catalog. I don't even know. Oh, 93. There it is. Yep. This, I can't. Get it, hey, baby. I am a I robot. Was, uh, ah, fuck it. Who cares? It's a '93. '93. I was probably a junior in high school. Oh shit! I even have lists in here. Stuff I ordered. Still, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah. If you get whoa, do you remember Dermograph ta Dermographics Tattoo Supply? Yeah, they were in Lenoka Harbor. It's just north of uh, Atlantic City. Yeah. Look, I got early icon literature i got all kind of old school literature like again i pack rat anything that has the word tattoo or you know a person with a tattoo I, I grab it up and i just stuff it in a box i got boxes of those, of those old magazines and it was, it was pretty cool to flip through it it brought back a lot of memories man oh, yeah yeah dermographics used to sell needles that they like they dip the needle head in wax or something or some weird shit you remember yeah, buying so needles from them yeah, so they didn't and, uh, get damaged and then ship it. Yeah, they would like they would like dip it in like some kind of weird like silicon gel or wax or yeah, something. I had the little 
around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. recently, not too long ago, I uncovered, like, I had some blood shovels that I got from them. They were, like, 25 mags, yeah. <laughs> like, dipped in dipped in wax and stuff. Uh, I don't, I mean, I guess I, like, I, I saw the the tattoo artist magazine with Philip Lou in it and went fucking crazy buying like 25 mags and then shredding people's backs off. <laughs> <laughs> I was still packing with like a shovel. Flat. <laughs> Blood shovel. <laughs> it sounds relaxing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's no numbing cream back then, dog. <laughs> Just like, yeah, there was, there was no messing like, around back then. You don't need like, these top two layers of skin. <laughs> I want 14 wraps with a blood shovel. Yep. Yeah. One and a half inch tube. Steel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. But yeah, yeah I like I uncovered I still- a couple of those. Bunch of stuff. I don't know. There's for, for whatever reason. I mean, it's just like anybody else. I keep a bunch of stuff and um I still have like my needle making kit and uh yeah. and all that stuff. And recently a buddy, my my buddy Dan Lielli, uh, he owns a, a, a place called Fat Cats in Atlantic City. And he gave me his, oh, look at that. Hey, you know that, uh, I think um, there's a version of that or that tat- I tattooed that on my friend Ray Nunzi. I think you tattooed, uh, I remember you tattooing that on Swing. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure I tattooed that on Ray. That's little, funny, it's just sitting here on my desk. Somebody must have moved it while I was on vacation. There's a panther shark behind you. Yeah. Right behind you, that's one of mine too. Yeah, and the Biomex on the other wall there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I showed that last, I think, last podcast. Crazy, I'm sure that shit is living. You're taking <laughs> over my spot, son. <laughs> yeah. By the uh, way, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I couldn't come up to see you. Actually, yeah, it would have been a lot of work, man. Across oh, that yeah, that was insane. Yeah, because, like, uh, uh, I was just like, oh, you, I could take the ferry to you, or you could, well, I was thinking I could take the ferry to you. Or you could take the ferry to me in Cape May. Yeah. But uh, right now that ferry is just insane. Like it's hard to get on. And, uh, you know, Mike Wilson was just at the shop and he was down at uh, Todd Noble's shop in yeah. Fenwick Island, Delaware. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he went to get on the ferry early in the morning on Saturday and it was already jammed up. He couldn't get on. So he had to drive all the way around to the Delaware Mor- Memorial Bridge and take Route 40 to uh to the shop actually took it to my house because my house is like just off route 40 and uh so it's like you know it it seems like it's close because like delaware is like you know like not too far from us but you have to go around this like you got to go around the delaware uh river basically you know to get down there yeah i don't know what you guys do i just hung out the beach went up to rehoboth there i did see a bunch of shops down there but i just i didn't really want to yeah you know, I was on vacation, although I love tattooing. I love everything about it. And there is a cat down there that has a, a museum in uh, Rehoboth. A tattoo museum? Well, he, he has a bunch of machines. Oh, really? Like Flash. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 we looked it up online. He said, he, yeah, he had some cool, cool machines. And I was intrigued by it. But I was with my family and my kids. Yeah. So it, it, for me to take the time away and go up there would have been difficult. But yeah. when we go next year, I, I'm, I'm going to plan on stopping in. Almost every time I go on vacation, I try to work. Really? Like, yeah. That's not a vacation. Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's work. There's a I difference. Did. I fucking love tattooing. You know what a, what, dude, Yo, my like wife last year, killed me. <laughs> last year, uh, we went camping down in Virginia, like near Virginia Beach. Yeah. And uh, I, I was you know, lucky enough to get a spot at uh, Electromagnetic with Annette LaRue and uh, Steve Tiberi. Nice. And uh, I was like, and my friend, my friend Martin uh, works there. We've been very good friends for a long time. Um, Martin Buchler, he's a fantastic tattooer, super, super good guy. And uh, I've known him for years and years and he's worked at our shop a bunch. So he set it up and I went down there to go work and I was so excited to work with Annette and Steve. And I, I meet Steve for like, you know, two seconds. You know, I mean, I talked to him for 20 minutes. He's like, all right, well, I'm, I'm headed back to Philly. You can take my spot. So I didn't even get to work with him. <laughs> it was like, you know, but everybody else was there. Chris is, Chris is really cool. Uh, Lester Garcia, amazing tattooer. And uh, I mean, and that being able to like go, 
you know, and go to another place of, you know, a foreign environment and work in a place that, you know, it, it used to be ancient art. It was owned by Crow. Yeah. And there's like, you know, you know, tons of cool flash and cool paintings and stuff to look at and cool people to hang out with. And they got a mini ramp in the back. Like, come on, man. I was like, you know, I was home. like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, all right, well, you know, there's nobody coming in to get tattooed. Let's go skate for a little bit. And, yeah. you know, stuff like that was like, it was like really cool. So, to, you know, it's, it's and like, and, and trust me, I love my family and I love like, you know, being with them and stuff, but it's important for me to like, you know, travel when I can uh, a, a little bit, but not a lot. Just to, just when I can, and to me it's a treat. So uh, almost every single time uh, I go somewhere, I try to like work. You know, I was just up at uh, Niagara Falls, and uh, and that that I think that was like the first time I was like, hey, I'm probably not. I'm not going to try to work. I'm just going to just go and you know hang out and rest and stuff. And uh, so that's it for me. I mean, I like I like traveling and working. So yeah, you know, it's still vacation. You know. Yeah, I just feel like you know, after 30 something years of nonstop grinding, I think I've only had like my vacations generally every year are the Virginia beach tattoo convention. Yeah. <laughs> and we sit on the beach in the morning and have yeah. coffee. And then I go to work all day. That, yeah. that, that was usually um, my vacation. Yeah. My vacations were usually conventions. Yeah. But, uh, Cause it's hard to sit still. I will tell you, we, I, I went for six days and it was different for me just to sit and do yeah. nothing, not know anybody, not be interested in doing anything, just sit on a beach. That was it's tough. Rough. But it's I started to acclimate after a couple of days and it was really cool. Hey guys, yeah. I don't want to interrupt. I've got a question from YouTube coming from Ricardo. He yeah, says, what's up, Ricardo? <laughs> he says, what's up, everyone? I have a question. What would you say are some of the most important things to look for in a tattoo machine daily driver versus every once in a while usage? What kind of machine are we talking about? Coil or rotary? Well, we'll ask them. Well, I mean, I, well we could hit them both. I'll say with, uh, <laughs> well, that's a multifaceted question. <laughs> in my Let's just say this. If you, if you, if you, uh, you want a liner that makes lines. Yeah. <laughs> like, you want it to be an extension of your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, like the other, Smooth. like, it's like, he it's said such, both. He says a non specific question. Uh, rotaries, I, I couldn't even tell you. I don't really know much about rotaries. Uh, uh, I don't, you know, I don't use them. I don't make them. Not that they're bad. I just, it's just, you know, not on my radar. But uh, I, have, I have a little experience with a rotary, and I use one that's called a whip. And uh, Doug, Doug Nadzeski had turned me on to this thing. And I, I'm hardcore coil all the way, all day. That's how I started. Um, so just to do, do a quick synopsis of, of the rotary, I like give. And that's why I like coil machines. I like give. Um, yeah. Got to have a break. Yeah, a little a bit of break. Otherwise, it, it, I mean, there are some rotaries. I know the direct drives, they're... <clears throat> they hit so hard they can carve right to the bone yeah. but it, this this whip and i think they're re-releasing them they're out they're from australia it, it, it has the option to adjust the a bar and it, it's a uh, it's like a polymer cast a bar so over time it gets squishier like an ordered spring so when mm -hmm. it hits the skin it has give but it has consistent needle depth and it has you can adjust your depth you know just like a, like a regular machine and it holds a regular tube it's not you just clip the cartridge in but uh you can always it, go it, by it's the, smooth uh, like it's super smooth and consistent it's almost like painting with an airbrush when you do black and gray and i, I was having trouble with some of my coil machines back in the day just being too choppy with my yeah. black and gray so i had to you know i saw what doug was using and he turned me on to that and boy it, it changed the game for like larger grouping like huge passes of fields of wash it made it so much smoother for me right um flip it over to a coil side i was just getting too salt and peppery of a wash like i you know it could i could adjust my technique but it was just something about it um that i had some trouble with and then uh 
I just noticed the coil machines for me, like working with straight black pepper shade and whip shade work better. And then hitting that rotary since it, there it's like, it's soft. It's, it's weird. It's, it's a whole different game. So that's what I look for in the elements of my shaders. Um, as far as packing color, man, I go coil all day. Um, what do I look for? I got an incoming call. Just ignore that. Um, what do I look for? I look for a smooth runner um, that hits the call from private caller. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call to interrupt. <laughs> Blowing my train of thought. I can't call even. There, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I look for a smoothness, um, low voltage runner, no chatter. Um, no chatter. Yeah, something like you. Something you don't have to mess with. Something you can pick up every day. I don't necessarily like a light machine. Um, I like a little bit of weight in my in my coil machines to keep the vibration down. Um, I like a bit of give on my shaders, on my liners even. I like a bit of give. Um, I've actually been lining with a Paul Rogers shader, um, heavier groupings. I I. I it was just, it, that's the way I do it, you know, and everybody's different. Some people like those super fast 20, 22 Hertz caps that just rip shit fast, man. Liners. Yeah. Um, one thing I've noticed it, through experimenting with the coils and, and um, rotaries, as far as okay. lining is concerned is I haven't found a consistent, rotary machine to pull lines with I, I know the cubans my guys love the cubans for lining they say it's like drawing with a magic marker <clears throat> i haven't tried that yet but i've always been partial to the weight and the balance of a coil and how it hits um i could pull a line from your forehead to your toes in yeah. one sweep and it's consistent and i've noticed with a lot of these rotaries man it slows me down like uh, it's significantly at least half pace and I'm used to I'm old school I'm used to working fast so when you got to change up your game when you're lining with a coil to a rotary I just think there's more consistency in strength in the lines I don't yeah. know if it's the power or whatnot but uh that's me, that's what I look for in my personal machines um I line with one I use it for every grouping um I have a really clean sweep from 4.9 to 7.1 if i need the power for different groupings but i like a little bit of give i kind of like a hybrid machine for a line or a coil machine this is actually what i'm talking about right here believe yeah. it or not and that's a shader and i line with that and it just has a ridiculously long stroke yeah and that, i like to see my needle and where it's where it's going yeah so that's, I think for me, um, like, uh, not, not so much for me, but I think you have to ask the question uh, before you even like start looking at machines. Like, there's like kind of like an equation that I always keep in mind, and it's from Seth Safari uh, from like Tattoo Artist Magazine, like a million years ago. He had a little art article in there, and it always stuck with me. It's a uh, hand speed versus machine speed versus pigment viscosity. So like keep those things in mind when, you know, you're, you're, you're trying a liner out or something like that. You know, maybe if you move really slow, maybe a rotary would work better for you. Uh, if, if they move slow, I mean, I know you can make a move, whatever you want, but, but just to piggyback on what, um, Tony was saying, uh, I like a good break in the skin. Um, one thing I, I noticed like when, uh, the thing that made me like I, I make I make shaders that are long stroke uh, and very punchy uh, and they run at low volts also. But um, the thing that made me start making machines that way that didn't hit super, super hard. I mean, they can hit super hard if you want. If you turn it up, it'll hit hard. If you keep it at a, a medium voltage, uh, you'll get really nice, clean whips and uh you know, you can just slow down that whip and go and just whip it out and you'll, you'll get a nice gradation of pepper. Uh, the thing that like made me realize uh, how I want a machine to run is uh, I watched, I watched like video footage a long time ago of Horiyoshi the uh, third doing Tabori uh, tattoos. 
And it was like the way that the needle went in and flipped up and went in and flipped up. And, you know, the pace that he was going, it was like the needle didn't leave the skin. It always just stayed buried in the skin and it would flip up like that. And uh, I try to mimic like how, you know, a needle grouping can massage the pigment into the skin. And like this way, uh, you know, you have less trauma to the skin and you have maximum saturation. Um, so for a shader, I would say like a longer stroke uh, and a good break. Like, you know, if, you know, you, you could look at a look at the meter all day, but your thumb meter, this is the thing that tells everything, you know, put your yeah, thumb on that right. bitch and make sure it's like, you know, it's mimicking what it's going to do in the skin. Um you know, and the same thing Tony said, like no chatter, no bullshit. I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of using O-rings. I know that a lot of people do, but in my, in, in my opinion, um, like you, if you, if you have chatter and you throw an O-ring on there and it runs a certain way, uh, it's not going to run that certain way. You're always going to chase that first, you know, tap that first day of that machine because that o ring's going to, uh, dry rot eventually it's going to fall off. And, you know, as it dry rots, you're, you know, you know, working your contact screw to close the gap or, you know, whatever. And then you put uh, that O-ring back on and then you're beat, you know, then you got to like chase that first day again. So in my opinion, it's, it's always, uh, it's always best for me uh, to tune that machine correctly or as correct as you possibly can and try to eliminate all those noises, all that chatter and stuff like that. Um, now, like, I mean, yeah, I can't speak for every builder out there. And I'm not, I'm certainly not like, you know, saying anything bad about anybody that uses O-rings. It's whatever, you know, I, they're just not for me. Uh, but if, if you're asking, I'm telling you. <laughs> like, you know I, mean? I do have actually some more questions too. You guys um, want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, bring them on. Those? All right. Jason from Philadelphia, he says, so the great debate I have had with a few different artists is should you, as an artist, adjust or tune the machine you buy, assuming it's a coil, to fit your hand speed and style, or should you leave the machine unmolested and adjust it to the way that the machine runs? Uh, I mean, you got to like run it the way you want to run it. With, we, we covered this last month with Schweiger. Yeah. Everybody's different, man. Like the way I build a machine, I might send it to you. You might hate it. You know, people build me machines, sent me machines. I'm not going to drop names. But I mean, some heavy duty. I mean, I've paid big money for these machines and I get, no, yours are always good. <laughs> of course, yours are always great. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not going to say any names. But I mean, I, I've paid some heavy money for machines and I've got them. And I'm like, I can't even, I can't even, like, I'd have to tear the whole thing down and rebuild the thing to Damn. run the way that I tap Name names, bro. <laughs> What's that? I said, name names, bro. No, fuck. <laughs> That'll end my career real quick. No, I don't want to. I don't know. I don't like fires. Oh, I just, man. I accept things the, people, the way they the are. People ask you the questions, man. They want the juicy bits, dude. What's I'm up? a collector. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a collector. So yeah, yeah. To, to get back to your point, tune it the way you like it. Tune it the way it fits you. Why? It, well, I mean, I guess it could go both. It's like a double-edged sword. You could retrain yourself and it might strengthen your abilities. But if it doesn't, tune it the way you like it, man. I, 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 I mean, they're tools, it, it, man. That's a tough, that's actually now that I'm really thinking about it, that's a tough question, man. It's a, I don't think it's a tough question at all. I think like if, uh, I mean, any machine that I ever got, I tuned. Yeah. Any. You know what I mean? Like every single machine, any, any machine that I ever ordered from anybody, you tune it, you make it yours. But uh, if I, I'll say this, if if the guy's making it and he's a tattooer, and look at his work. Do you like what he's doing? If he's making nice lines, if he's making nice shading, and if he's making um, and if he's like doing like fully, you know, saturated color, then like take his suggestion at least first. You know, like just like use it, and if it if it works. Awesome. Leave it alone. If it doesn't work for you, then, you know, you know, try to like, you know, tune it and do whatever you got to do. I try to make machines so that like the only thing you got to touch is like the contact screw. 
you know, like, you, you know, every week or every other week, you know, you give it a little file to get that carbon off and you turn it just slightly, you know, get a good baseline of like hearing it and feeling it, you know, or looking at numbers. If you understand the numbers, more power to it. If you don't, that's cool too. But uh, get a feel for like at what voltage you would like it to run and for how you want it to feel and how you want it to sound and like burn it into your brain. And then like, all you got to do is like, you know, clean your contact point and uh, occasionally take a piece of paper and put it in between, you know, you know, put it in between your, uh, your a bar and the front coil and just like put that paper in there, hold it down and just take it out and take that little bit of carbon out. I mean, it's not incredibly hard to do if you know how to do it. And then, you know, then you have, then your, then your coil machines will last you forever. You know, because yeah. over time, we all know that like over time, like coil machines, they just age like fine they line. Get better. Yeah. You know, they get better and better. You know, they break in and then they're like, you know, like I've been using the same shader for I think almost three years now, two years, three years. Just like this, this, this crummy unfinished bulldog shader that I just made, I made it just to make it to see if, if they ran any, any good. And I've been using it ever since. And I've pretty much used it on every tattoo, except for, you know, the machines that I'm sending out that I break in. So, yeah, I mean, tune your machines. Fuck with them. Who cares? They're yours. They're not mine. You bought them. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You buy them, they're yours, you know? Yeah. You know unless, you have, like, of... unless you have something that's like, you know, like, you know, something that you're collecting because it's going to be worth money someday or something. Like, you get it like a crazy Aaron Kane or something like that or, you know, like you know, like if, if, if you're just like, if they're just daily drivers and do your worst, you know, but uh, if it's something that, you know, if you mess with it, it's going to be worth less money, which is whatever too. That's like, you know, that, that's cool that you, if you collect them and stuff, but I don't know. Yeah. Tune them. Who cares? You know, I mean, like, what's the big deal? The worst can, worst that's going to happen is it's going to go out of tune and like, you know, you can send it back to somebody and like try to get them to tune it again or whatever. Good luck with that. But <laughs> yeah, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> I mean, you send it back to me, I'll get it back to you as soon as possible. Cause like, you know, I'm not a dickhead, but like, uh, you know, a lot of these dudes, like you send their shit back. It's like later <laughs> keeping it for three months. <laughs> yeah. I've been there. <laughs> what are you going to do? I mean, we build, we build machines. We got shit to do, you know? So I don't know. No. Anyway. Yeah. Next sometimes time. when you buy a machine too, that it, it, Jerry Rieger hit me to a lot of, uh, a lot of things to look for. We, we used to walk around the convention floor and there'd be, you know, young kids, new builders would have tables full of machines and he could pick up a machine and spin it in two seconds. and be like, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. This needs to change. He went and he wasn't rude about it, but he would yeah. just point things out. Like these are all the things that I taught you to look for. And these are the things you should look for. And you'll know right off the bat, whether or not you're getting a quality piece. Yeah. Now, a person can build a perfectly geometrically sound machine that could run like shit, and there could be so many different variables involved that causes problems. Oh, Just, it's insane. But when you when you get a machine, it depends on what the builder did. Like for myself, there have been times where you know I had to build 10, 15 machines fast and get them out to supply companies, and I've got repeated phone calls like why are you taking so long and it's because i take my time i tune them the way i need them to operate and run and i use every single one so i know when it gets to your hands that it runs the way that i like it that i know it should hit in the way it works for me now that being said you could get that machine and hate it so it, it just that's a really tough question in my mind. Yeah. Like you could get a machine that somebody just built, put together, lined up the geometry. So the needle set centered and, and they get it to you and it could be jarred in shipping. It could be, you know, the, the atmospheric change through the heat, the swelling, the shrinkage. Cause I know with my machines, when I first bend the springs, put them together and run them, I'll let them sit in the drawer for a day and I'll come back the next day. That machine won't run the same because that spring compression settled. It heated up. 
from me playing with it, putting it together, cranking everything down, everything needs to settle. So generally as a machine builder, and this is what I taught years ago, and Schwager even brought it up, is we hang them for 24 hours. You need at least, at least 24 hour runtime on a new machine, on a version machine to start to marry the A bar to the front coil, as mm -hmm. long as they're, they're set. Yeah. Over time. Got to hit flat. Over time, things are going to heat up. Things are going to settle. There's going to be um, metallic dust burning off. The, 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 the uh, contact screw is going to spit sparks till it settles and burns in. Like there's certain things, you, it, it, it just takes time to really smooth these things out. And then you still have to go back and adjust. There's been times where, like, for example, I've had this... When did I build? I build this this year actually, and I've been using this liner. And I'll throw a five in, I'll throw a seven in, and I'll have to on the fly just give it a little tweak because maybe the AC was too cold one day. They're just they're finicky sometimes, man. But Not for only the that, most, like you could like you could you know like I use lamp wire for my clipboards. Like I make my own clipboards, and I use oh excuse me, not lamp wire. Uh, uh speaker wire 16 gauge speaker wire uh because you know these clip cords that you just buy from whatever supply company are either made in china or they're made by somebody that's not using like proper copper wire a lot of it has like aluminum wire and stuff oh, and shit wire, and dude. yeah and like you don't even realize that like that's the clip cords part of the circuit and you know the i mean i have a i, I run a uh what do you call it um what are they called? The jewel? What are, they, what are these damn things called? The foot switch. These guys. One of these dudes. Yeah, that's know? all I use. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's got, like, you know, I got it, like, with speaker wire also. Because it's part of, you know, it's part of the circuit. You know, the electricity is going through the, the, the speaker wire. I mean, it's going through the foot switch. This is just as much as it's going to the machine. So, like... You know, like you can you can make a machine and uh, set it up, and then you know you you send it to somebody, and they they might be using some beat ass clip clip cord or whatever, and it runs like a whole half a volt less than what you're supposed to than you know, than what you were running it. You know, so there, that's just the tip of the iceberg as far as like you know uh, factors as to why it would run differently. You know, you yeah, know what I mean? Spend your money on a good clip cord. Is that another question? On question. Um, uh, from the Tattoo Now channel from Dark Decay. Uh -huh. First of all, he made me laugh because he said that was your um, car warranty. They were calling about the warranty on your car. <laughs> but his question is, what is the function of the capacitor and what changes does it make when you use different sizes of capacitors? Go. You want this one? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with that. So to okay. me... My interpretation is a capacitor is like a little storage unit. And to, it, 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 in kind of a simple light, I look at it as a waveform changer with power. So what a capacitor essentially does is it stores up a little charge of electricity and re-releases it. Um, to me, it, I've always heard that and it didn't make sense to me, like how the, the function works. But what made sense to me was like a sawtooth waveform. So when you use a smaller capacitor, <clears throat> when you have a waveform, like a saw pattern, like a 22 hertz, will tighten that saw pattern up and make it flutter faster, which in turn, it smooths it out. So it's more, it's like a faster current. <clears throat> the larger it gets, the more choppy the current is. And it actually, it stores a larger amount of electricity and releases it. So every time that current goes up, it shoots that spark out, or not the spark, but it shoots that power harder out and makes it a harder hit. So most shaders are choppy, and a choppier shader is designed um, to shake up that old denser pigments, like powder pigments. So liners, when, you're, when you use a liner, the old school way was a 22 hertz cap, and that's the smaller one. It kept the waveform tighter and you had, you had less density in your pigments, so it'd flow freely and fast, so you could move quicker. The, uh, it, yeah, it, 
I don't want to repeat myself, but the larger the cap, you'll hear the difference. Yeah. That, I always interpret it, uh, you know, a capacitor as uh, it fills up with electricity and releases it. Yeah. Fills up, releases, fills up, releases. So, if, you know, if you think about like, you know, a larger one taking this long to fill up and then releasing, it creates, it's like, it, you know, it, it's it kind of slow, it's a, a slower uh, sort of hit than like a 22 which would fill up faster, release, fill up faster and release. So, um, you know, like a smaller one, you know, anything smaller as far as like coils, uh, capacitors and stuff like that, smaller is always faster. Yeah. You know, like bigger is always, uh, is always choppier. Biggers are always choppier. Smallers run really zippy and smooth. Yeah. 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 Um, so but the same thing could be said for like, you know, how many wines on your coils, you know, if you're, if you're using, you know, you know, eight or 10, you know, those, like you're going to, it's, it's, it, let's just say you're using eight or 10 layer coils at, you know, six volts, six volts being like the, the, that's the control for the experiment. Um, you know, it runs at a certain pace, but if you, if, you know, it, it'll run pretty slow. So if you use, you know, sixes or something like that, if you, if you, lessen the amount of wire um it will run a lot faster because there's less wire and you know i always think of like you know you always think of like water in terms of electricity like you know that capacitor is filling up with water and releasing or you know it has to run from point a to point b uh but the longer the points are away from each other it's like takes longer for that cycle to to occur you know so like that's like one hurt or whatever like uh, one duty cycle. So the more wire that you have, it takes it's longer. Uh, it takes it, it it takes a longer time to get from point A to point B. So it would be slower. And it's the same thing with capacitors. Like if it's larger, it's a uh, it's slower, uh, shorter, faster. I used I I just use I use the same uh, for either liners and shaders. Yeah, I did uh, now. Yeah. yeah, I just got it down to that. I think I'm running, these are like 50 UF, you know, big doo doo ones. Um, been using these for quite a while. I was using Nichicon for a while, but like, I don't know, I got a bad batch of Nichicons and, uh, and I stopped that shit because I had machines coming back and I like, nobody, no tattoo machine builder wants that. <laughs> like, you know, the sprags are nice. Yeah, sprigs are nice. Yeah, Sprague forty sevens. Uh, I use on mine. Yeah, as far as I know, they're made in in, in the USA too. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what um what the difference is, but ever since I switched to those, they're great. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, mine are all. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much more we can expand on capacitors, but um, that's my inter- and I, I hope like I I feel like I'm not making any goddamn sense. Like I get up in the morning, I drink a cup of coffee, I come and try to do these things, and I feel like I talk way too much. <laughs> like, and like you know like i'm like i'm sitting here talking to my friends but like i like i'm like oh dude i sound like a fucking moron dude like well the thing is you, <laughs> we could break this down into a technical aspect but yeah yeah okay yeah, like i'm not a scientist easier. i just build tattoo machines like i'm like don't overcomplicate you don't have to overcomplicate it's just a simple yeah, yeah, yeah. explanation that's yeah, how i yeah. look at it you know yeah. a lot of guys will get into it, 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 measuring frequency and metering and homage and yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. way I look at it is, I've been doing this the way I've been doing it for years. I I delved there, I dove into that information, but to me, it's pointless because the way I've configured everything works the way it works. The way I understand everything works yeah. just fine, and it's yeah. simple that way. So why overcomplicate it? Yeah, you're right. I'm not an engineer. No, no, no. Me neither. We just make, like I said, we just make tattoo machines. You know, I just look at it like if it does what you're supposed to do, then it's doing, then then it's good. You know, like if I have to, you know, if I have to break in a machine, I always I break in every machine before I send it out. But you know, sometimes like recently I made a, a black and gray shader, which I don't really make too much of, and uh, I didn't have any black and gray to do. You know, so I just you know, you know, started like do, doing a wash on my leg <laughs> just to make sure it worked before it got sent out. You know, because like you want to know that it works right, you know, or works correctly. And then when the guy got it, there was no problem with it. It was cool. But 
you know, for, for my own peace of mind, like I have to know that it works right. You know, and crazy experiments with capacitors. I remember back in the day, oh boy, when they blow up, they're fun too, not to get off track, but like a 22 going off, we double up, you know, the, double up the 22s. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Know, never really did anything. The only thing I ever noticed um, with coil and capacitor configurations with the smaller caps is a lot more heat. Yeah. And it, it could have yeah. just been the combination of the machines I had. I had an old Eagle national liner with a 22 and it had like fucking 10 wrap shorties or 12 wrap shorties. This yeah. thing was a cannon. I still have it. It was one of my first machines. That fucker's a cannon dude. Yeah, it's yeah. fast. It's hard. It's got the really wide, like almost like a one inch rear spring, like a three quarter front. Dude, wow. that thing hits so hard. It's ridiculous. Take your arm off. And it's fast. Like there's, to me, there's absolutely no need to go that hard and fast. Dude. Yeah. Unless you're in a marathon. Yeah. So guys, uh, Dark Decay says, thanks. I appreciate that. It makes sense. And we do oh, have well, another question. It makes sense to somebody. That's, <laughs> it works for me, brother. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I'm like explaining it. Like, I'm like, oh my God, what am I even saying? <laughs> well, you approach it. I mean, you can approach it two ways. You can approach it as a layman or as a tech head. And I yeah. just, I'm not tech savvy. This I don't know. Like, it's like in my head, it like works. Yeah. And then like, when you try to explain it, you're just like, uh, you know. Like, it just, oh. it starts and it goes bang. Yeah, you, <laughs> That's it. You hit foot switch. It, it, you hit the foot switch and it goes. It wow. goes bzzz. Yeah. <laughs> it either sounds thumb, like bzzz thumb bzzz meter. Bzzz bzzz Use your thumb meter. All right. Know. We've got another question from Philadelphia. Oh, he says, any advice on using coil machines with cartridges, tuning changes, adjustments, oh, oh. power? <laughs> no. Oh, God. <laughs> I have no advice. Yeah, don't. <laughs> don't. Get an autoclave. <laughs> Get some tubes. All right. So I, I'll start this one, Greg. You can, I, I, I I've nothing. experimented. I got nothing. One of my favorites, uh, see, I've always used metal, metal tubes. I, you know, I started in the late eighties, early nineties. So I yeah. had heavy machines with heavy tubes and it was like, it's solid, man. Right. You don't hear any fluctuation. I could dip that thing and run it a foot long and there's no variance. You won't hear any machine difference variance. And then they switched over to, I, I don't know who the first company was. But they came up with those disposable um, full tubes, which I still use to this day. I finally found one that works. But as soon as I put my machine on there, <laughs> that motherfucker was like, Whoa. it just bang. <laughs> and like anytime you move, I'm trying to tune machines. I'm trying to tattoo. You could hear the fluctuation, the movement. Yeah. Yeah, so that was, that, was, that, was, that was the beginning, right? Somebody finally came up with, with a taut enough. And, and I have to give it up to Derb because he came up with the, the, the disposable with the steel, oh, yeah. the, the metal, the yeah, true tube. Awesome. And that's fantastic. That's absolutely one of my favorite tubes to use in a coil machine. Um, now, there are some better plastic materials out there that alleviate that, the wonkiness for, uh, you know, my technical term. But uh, now you, you're talking about the uh, disposable grip. And the disposable tip now, that's a whole different conversation. Um, I'm okay with using the whole throwaway tube and tip combination. But when it comes to a coil machine and the grip and removable tips, the disposable tips, I do not like that. I think there's way too many points in the connection that destroys efficiency it softens the blow. There's a lot of movement, wobble. Um, in comparison to a way a coil machine runs versus a, uh, a rotary, I think, it, 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 I will have to say it's a little more violent in its action, and it, it creates these breakpoints th that I, I don't enjoy. Like, I haven't found a combination that works well for me yet. I've tried to line even with a rotary and there's just too much, there's too many points, like touch points along the path. Like I like a straight needle bar. Um, stiff needle bars. A, a stiff needle bar with even a stiff needle bars. Like, 
difference, you know? Stiff grommet right to right to the A bar. I use paper um, towel grommets. Paper towel grommets even way yeah. more efficient. I got yelled yeah, at by Aaron Kane. He's like, why are you using rubber grommets, dude? I use paper towel grommets because uh, to me, it's, it, it's, it's like less resistance. Right. And that's like efficient. really... You know, like if you're if you're making coil machines or whatever, like you 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 want to think about, uh, you know, the least amount of resistance as possible, and uh, and less like if you're using, I would say if you're using cartridges and you're using it in a in a coil tattoo machine, um, unless that like unless it's set up and tuned with a cartridge on it, like you're it's not going to work the same way that uh you have if you have steel tubes or disposable tubes and like a regular uh needle with a needle bar and uh either a paper towel or a rubber grommet um and the reason you know it, and like and just to you know hop on to what tony was saying is uh there's so many little mechanisms you know there's like springs and shit inside those little cartridges and the thing that i i just found it just like causes too much resistance so like yeah. Uh, if you know you've got the the needle bar that's pushing the back of the cartridge and stuff like that right i mean it, i'm not super familiar with how it works but uh if it's if, if that machine isn't running you know if it's not tuned specifically for that it's going to run a lot slower and you're going to have to use a lot more uh voltage uh you're going to turn the voltage up and if you turn the voltage up on some of these machines, they can like you know burn your fucking hand off so like uh and, and, you know, it would be my, you know, whatever, uh, you know, my opinion or, you know, just like common knowledge that I have that if you're if you're going to use like a cartridge, use it in a rotary, you certainly could use it for uh, uh, in a coil machine. But like I said, you're going to you're going to meet a lot of resistance trying to get that thing up to speed, uh, especially if you're trying to line something. You know, it just seems like uh, the more resistance that you have uh, in your coil machines, the, the more you're going to slave out the capacitor and, uh, you know, make those coils heat up because, um, it's, you know, the, you know, that electricity is going in there faster than it can be dispersed. Uh, yeah. So to your point though, just saying that as well, it, it does the same thing to those little motors. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't, I mean, I don't know anything about little motors. Like I Have wish you I ever did. like <laughs> take in one of those tips and press down they're, they're spring loaded right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. So you're already building resistance. You're already fighting the motor before you even start. Whereas that's a, when a, you're in that, standard two, there a, is a real interesting very little. Question, like something I've thought of before, but like I've never thought like I'd have to explain that. <laughs> you know, like I, I, we went through this through years. I, I went through the course of how people come up with new technology, and I, I'm all for technology. And I'm all for it being applied to old school tactics and whatnot. But there are just some things in my personal opinion that work better than others. And getting back to the Philadelphia question, I think it comes down to what's going to work for you again, because I'm, I'm neither for nor against any of this technology. Oh, yeah, I don't care. Like, I don't I don't um, care what people do. I don't my care. recommendation, honestly, would be walk backwards to the beginning and then walk forwards do a small experiment now take a steel tube and a taut needle bar try it with a piece of cloth on the on the a bar nipple then change that out try it with a rubber grommet then change that out try your your other setups then go to a plastic try that and then work your way up to these three piece and then you decide for yourself what you think it, runs better, puts in a better line, feels better, sounds better, and is more efficient. And that's how I work through it. And that's how I came to my conclusion. Um, I will honestly say, and this is something I stand behind, and this is, by no means is disrespectful to the industry, but I think I love plastic tubes. I use them, but I do think steel is the way to go if for, yeah. if for for it's like so much the, more rigid the, it it sense, the power like, for perfection in your lines man you're not going to beat that but when it comes to shading yeah i'll take a plastic tube and throw that fucker out and it that's no problem to me it's 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 laziness because there's a lot of work in 
sterilization. There's a lot of setup time. There's a lot of breakdown time. There's a lot of time involved. And I just think, and this is the part where I said no disrespect, I think a lot of people are getting too lazy. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, it makes your job easier and it cuts down on time and you can make more money and it, it's more efficient. But remember, you're putting a piece of lifetime art on somebody's body. You want to do the best possible work you, you can with it. It's not to say you can't do it with a three-piece plastic tube, but go down the line and find what works for you. And then you decide for yourself, okay, the steel oh, yeah. might work great, but it's a pain in the ass. But is it, is it worth it to roll back? A friend of mine was like, make, you know, as far as like making, better. as far as like making more money, I mean, I don't, you know, by like not doing tubes, uh, I don't know how, I mean, like so a buddy of mine told me he spends 150 to 200 bucks a week in tubes. Yeah, on throwaways. Like, what? <laughs> like, what? I've had steel Why? tubes for 20 years. I swapped the tip off for a buck. Like, you know, that's yeah. like, you know, you know, that like, you know, like you could decrease your bottom line and your carbon footprint for that matter by uh ah, going you know, green baby <laughs> you know like yeah i mean like we're talking about carbon footprints and all this shit i mean like uh you know and people you know they're making dispose they're making dis you know somebody was making disposables out of like cork or something and plastic. i was just like oh plastic you know to reduce but under the under the thing like oh well you know we're gonna reduce our carbon footprint or you can reduce your carbon footprint by using a tube with cork and i'm thinking to myself like man just clean fucking tubes dude like, like, you know what I mean? Get an autoclave, clean your tubes. Like, two it's of my guys, two of my guys, they won't use plastic. They were dead set on plastic for years. They had piles of them. They're like, you know what? My line work's suffering. I yeah. Do you have an alternative? And I was like, dude, you ever use steel? No. You fucking steel. Try it. Just try it. Try it once, and you'll be like, oh my god. Especially with a coil machine, it, it changes the weight, the balance. And the cleanly, I'm, I'm going to tell you the cleanliest in, of your line work. Yeah. So I that, use, uh, that's my two cents steel on tubes. That. I use steel tubes and steel, uh, needle tips, but I use, uh, the, um, the black nylon autoclavable grips with like a yeah. grip cover on, on it. Yeah. And, uh, it's a lot lighter and you still get the feel of a steel tube. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you're not like holding on to this giant, you know, piece of stainless steel. Yeah, or you know, try tr the true tubes. If you you want a disposable, I mean, they're a little costly. Yeah, but the true tubes are fantastic. Oh, dude, yeah. excellent flow through those things. They're great. Yeah, Herb nailed it with that. That's the other thing too. Is like you, you like you know a lot of these. In my opinion, the disposable stuff when I use it, like you dip, but like oh, it's like you don't get a lot of like ink in the in the, oh, the flow. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, horrible. it's like it's hard. You don't get a lot of good flow and stuff, and that's what you really need. You know, you're tattooing through a pool. You know, you're making a line through a pool of ink. You know, like that was like how I was taught. You know, like if you like sometimes you can't see your line, you have to feel your way through it. That's how I was taught. Uh, so it's like I don't see how people can make lines without like a pool of ink and uh, at the bottom of the needle. You know, it doesn't make any sense. But people yeah, do it, so I don't know. I mean, if you want to make like a teeny tiny line, if you want to make like a line from your head to your toes, just like Tony said, <laughs> then you got to load up, you know, uh, and, you know, it's important to have tips that, you know, you're, you're able to get a lot of flow out of. Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. was a did certain the question. I'm not sure if we even answered the question. Did we? Yeah. I think we, we beat pretty it much like every a dead horse. Like, <laughs> pretty, yeah, pretty much every question is like, you know, Hey, what do you think of this? And then we're just like, do what you want. <laughs> like, it's like every single I mean, it, one. Like, I'll tell you a, this. A, you a, know, lot of, whatever, you know? a lot of learning comes through experience. So we don't know who's behind the question. Experience, time. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so I mean, like learning. It's good to go back and just get, walk through you how we got to where we're at, I think. The only way you get experience is through failure, you know? So like, you know, failure. Yeah, you have to experiment. Yeah, That's how yeah, we got yeah. got here. I'm self-taught. I am completely 100% self-taught at tattooing. Yeah. It was only until like 99 where I started to get direction on machine building. Like I've, I've picked up pieces from everybody, but I'm self-taught. 
and yeah. that was the way that's how i got here like oh look there's a new tube anybody use this yeah it's cool i use it i'm like this is shit like it just you got to figure out what works for you yeah yeah you know and it, it, it's through experience so yeah i think we answer the questions thoroughly and if not philadelphia i, I forget your username just that would be Jason Lesser. Up. He's got a lot of knowledge. Um, are you familiar with him? Philly Inc.? Lesser. Yep, Jason Lesser. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, and like, not for nothing. Well, you guys, ask it. You ask it like, you, any, anybody has any questions, like, you just hit me on the Instagram, you know, just DM me yeah, there or DM us or whatever, you know, and we can elaborate a little more if we can. I, Jay, so hopefully, I mean, you gained some knowledge from us. I know you have a lot of experience, but. Hopefully we can give you some of that different light on different information. So yeah, if you need anything, hit me up. Yep. If you have any other questions? Any other uh, questions, Lauren? Uh, no, we've got a lot of comments saying you guys rule. Um, super valid observation. Everyone's saying thank you for your insight. Um, someone else says this is becoming a lost art. Thank you guys for helping keeping something awesome alive. Learned experience is priceless. Yeah. Yeah. I, Thank you. I've all, I'm trying to figure out a way to word this. When I first started tattooing, I had no appreciation for the old school. I only knew what I knew. And as, as, uh, as some of the masters talked to me, I was, I was so stubborn in my mind. I was just like, no, I'm from a new generation. You guys are old. You don't know what you're talking about. And it took me years to find the truth and find my way to the light. Like I am not, I mean, I may be part of the new way at that time, which I'm not now. I may be part of that new way, but you have to respect the roots. You have to take it back. You have to appreciate where, where this all started and how we got here and what it is today. It's a stark contrast the, the industry of tattooing now than it was when I started. So now that I'm at, at this certain point, not to sound confusing, I go back to the beginning. Like, okay, we were pounding ink into people with fucking sticks. Today we're using drone motors and plastic. Like that's progression. That's life. That's awesome. That's normal. But personally, I've always had an appreciation no, I can't say always, it'd be a contradiction, but I've now gained a, appreciation for the root of tattooing. And I like to experience every aspect of it, like the hardship, besides the sponge and bucket. Like, I just, I'm not gonna mess with that. But I mean, I've met guys at conventions, you know, Tommy, uh, Tommy and Jerry and uh, Tommy Painter, especially. He didn't tattoo with rubber gloves. I mean, we've seen this, the Huck Spalding video. He didn't tattoo with rubber gloves. Skyver didn't tattoo with rubber gloves. You know, Jones used a, a, a sponge in a bucket. And yeah, that's what they used to wipe with. Like, I would never do that. But you have to understand where we started from and where we're at. And I think it, it's cool to go back. And, and this is a machine and tool perspective to try different power units, old stuff try old machines like nostalgia e even if you use it for five minutes just try it because you may learn something you may it may change your perspective you may find that you just love that it may reinvigorate something in you 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 just don't know till you try and that's that's kind of where i'm at with everything at this point in, in this whole conversation is about that especially the one about you know, the conversation about steel tubes to plastic disposables, to true tubes, to the three piece disposables. It's just, it, it was a process. This has all been a process. And I think it's to the listeners out there, this is your process. Just because I do it a certain way, doesn't mean it's right at all. It just, it works for me. Am I the greatest tattoo artist in the world? No. Am I the greatest machine builder? No. Do I know everything? No, I know what I know from being in this business since 1989. That's through these eyes, what I've seen, what was offered to us, the books, the internet, the supply companies, the old timers, 
the information that was available to us. It was none, nothing like it is today. We weren't doing podcasts, man. We didn't have internet. We had the library, the bookstore, and we had a small group of tattoo artists worldwide that we can confide in if, if, because it was very tight knit, if they would even talk to you about information. This city I'm at in Pittsburgh was so cutthroat. There was only three or four shops at the time when I started. If you walked into one of them and asked for information or an apprenticeship, your ass just got bounced out. They, it was just, it was so tight. It's nothing like it is today. Yeah. So through my experiences, through time, through generational change, the information comes to light. And I think it's cool to, to nail the point home to rewind yourself and try and dig into that and walk through it. Even if it's a couple of days, just try and walk through some of that stuff and feel it. It's different. Yeah. I think it'll give you much more love and appreciation for this art, this craft and your history. I always yeah. say this, like, you know, you know, not enough people get their lives threatened over tattooing and it shows, <laughs> you know, like, yes. you know, like, it's like, you know, like if you if you started out and, you know, you were doing something wrong, these dudes would fucking figure it out. And, you know, you know, you would get fucked up real bad because you were tattooing or something like that. You know, you had people threatening you and stuff. Um, and to me, you know, having, you know, somebody threaten me over tattooing just made me want to do it more and just made me appreciate mm-hmm. it more. You know, because it's not something you could just jump into back then. You know, it's uh, it's you had to know somebody. You had to, like, be down with somebody. And uh, and uh, like you didn't just tattoo out of your house. Like, you know, like you, that's it's there was, you know, that's how you got your hands broken and stuff like that. To me, I mean, none of that. I mean, I've gotten threatened. Nothing ever happened, you know, because I just don't care. You know, I just it, it, if anything, it made me really, really want it, you know, and really, really want to you know, make my way in tattooing, but now it's like no big deal. Like, you know, you know, like, you know, people come in like, Oh yeah, my 14 year old uh, niece wants to learn how to tattoo. Like, all right, she's probably going to tattoo. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, it's like, it's not even a big deal. Like somebody will teach her, you know? So, Oh, well, you know, and like, it's hard to, it's hard to, keep your spirits up about you know something that's like you know used to be so tight-knit and uh you know so special and so sacred and now uh it's getting kind of thinned out and this is like this is whatever man you know this this whole what i'm saying doesn't matter to anything it doesn't matter it's a it's a it's this the same conversation probably was happening in the fucking 60s and 70s like oh man there used to be 30 tattooers in the whole United States. Now there are 60. God damn it. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, this, this is, this, this shit has been going on for decades, really, oh, yeah. like, you know, but it's a little ridiculous now, but, um, and who cares really? I mean, like, you know, tattoo, don't tattoo. Uh, usually, you know, people that don't have their heart in it uh, get weeded out. They weed themselves out, you know? Yeah. We do have one more question. Um, I think we only have about 15 minutes left. Let's dive in. Dark Decay says, I'm curious about spring tensioners. What tension should I be looking for while tuning for ideal color packing? He also says, thank you for putting this together and answering my question from before. Yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a question that can be answered in person. It's really tough to like, if you, if we're talking about a a specific machine, you could feel your way around it, you know, like you could, you know, you know, you're looking at like, you know, how much tension's on it before it like, you know, it falls down to the coil. Uh, and, it, and it also depends on like your application. You yeah, know, I don't like, use a set number. I don't, I don't use a spring tensioner either. I too. I don't know. I, I mean, I no, what I, I, I use. I have a tensioner right here. Yeah, I don't you know. Like you can, you can get tech savvy with it. I know back in the day, Spalding used to send, the little compress sell the compression tensioner tensioners and I, yeah. I know a, a bunch of guys who do use them i can't answer that for you because i i personally don't do it so yeah i mean i'll be i'll be honest with you i use yeah. uh i thought, I thought, lauren, on the I thought lauren misspoke when she said tensioner i was like oh what <laughs> like she's like so she's really talking about it. i'm like oh yeah and no, i've never used one of those either yeah i don't use yeah. them 
I tune most of my stuff by ear and with an old icon or yeah, an old, uh, not icon, an old um, critical unit. One of the first series, the red faces. Yeah. I, oh, I that's, set that's my a machines to six, 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 zero duty and like a 4.7. And I'll just play with it because there's just so much variance in that, in that uh, 1095 steel. You just, you don't know how it's going to settle. Yeah. Um, I have yeah, a question yeah. for myself too. I'm curious about um, some machine builders like say Coco Fernandez or some of the European guys. Now yeah. that things are much more accessible international, how do you think that's impacting the future of uh, the direction of machine builders now? Whereas a lot of that information as tight as it was in the United States, it definitely wasn't accessible for the European guys. Well, I would tell you personally, Sorry. after doing, doing a bunch of uh, the, the videos and talking with a lot of people during the, the seminars and, and uh, the, the followers I gained, there's some guys like, like we're talking primitive, like in, in, in uh, I'm trying to think of the one guy's name in particular. It's, it's, they're going nuts over there with the information and they're coming up with some great stuff. And it's, it's fantastic. Uh, I've, I've seen these guys that are very primitive. Like the one dude, he builds machines. He lives in like a grass hut and stick welds, but he's just, he looks for scraps of metal around his little village and builds tattoo machines. And it's mind blowing to see. Um, yeah, man, I make think them. It's gonna I mean, explode, and we're gonna see a lot more cool stuff come out there. Just there's, like there's make them, be dude. Savants that just they're gonna run in it and into the business and just change the game. Like there's some great stuff coming out of Russia now. There, there's uh, some killer machines in Ukraine. Um, I talk about a French kid all the time. I, it, I can remember all the handles. There's so many males that come in, but they, they're all building now, and they're yeah. mimicking like the U.S traditional roger like rogers is a big thing paul rogers machines are huge jensen's are huge like these these kids are knocking them and they're the um there's one dude oh i can't remember his name najatted or something uh wish i uh, added jet uh, he does these these model c's like in bulldogs that are just they look og original stamp like they, he knocks them perfect they're beautiful. So yeah, information wise, I think we're going to see a lot more cool stuff coming up. I mean, there's a lot, of, there's been information out there for a long time for everybody when, to enjoy, but it, it I don't I see it's really reaching now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know if you're making machines cool. Like it's just that simple, like cool, make them. There's like a lot of people, it depends on like what you're making them for. Like, are you making them because you love making them or are you making them because you want to try to make a million dollars, you know? Yeah. Good um, luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that on either in either way. Uh, so I don't really, I don't really pay attention to the, to the part of it where it's like, Oh, well this, dude, there's too many machine builders and stuff like that. I mean, I think more tattooers should probably build machines and, you know, at least get a feel for like their tools before they go and put ink in the skin. Um, you know, just to further appreciate, you know, the process of, act, you know, like where, like starting from nothing and then like building it to something like, you know, making something that makes something is pretty cool. Uh, so that experience shouldn't be lost on anyone. As far as like, uh, you know, guys in Europe, there's, there's always been guys in Europe uh, doing really cool stuff. You know, there's, you know, there's been a ton of dudes in the States that are doing real cool stuff too. It just, to me, it like, it, it just really depends on your intention. You know, like if you're, like I said, if you're building machines because you love building machines, you know, get some metal in your eye, do it, you know, like fucking, you know, get your hands dirty, you know, breathe in that fucking smoke, you know, like, you know, do it, Inspired, man. You, know, you know, yeah, like get hype, like, you know, if you, you can start out making, you know, real basic stuff, or at least like assembling stuff, do it. And then uh, if you want to, you know, try your hand at, you know, really shaping something and making it cool, you know, making it to your taste, do it. You know, those things are great. Uh, if you're making machines and you're making machines for uh, for people and they're buying them, awesome. Make them good. You know what I mean? Like, don't don't put out shit that sucks, obviously. You know, that's, you know, a bad business model. But uh, you know what I mean? Like, it, it really depends on, like, who is making them. Like, you know, there's I know there's like 
there's probably dudes that like barely touch machines when they go out, you know, and that's all well and good, but like, yeah, nice. you, you know, it's not fucking cool. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you should, you should really take the time to like, if you're making a machine, make it, make it nice for that person. And it's something they're never going to, they're never ever going to put it on like tack gear for sale or some shit, you know, that's like, that's the only thing I don't really get like too passionate about it anymore. You know, like, uh, I'm, I'm a lot like Tony. Like I just kind of, I stay in my, you know, I stay in my workshop and I, I do my thing, you know, like, uh, I have my influences and I have like my reasons for making them. And I think you should too. Does that, does that answer anything? I don't know if it even answered anything. Uh, in short. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool that they're doing their thing, <laughs> you know? Awesome. Yeah, well, if you guys have any other questions, a lot of thank yous for putting this on. I know that we need to wrap up soon. Um, if you guys have any closing uh, remarks or anything like that, let's hear it. I don't know. I just, you know, like I said, make some machines. I've said it plenty of times on this thing, you know, get some metal, you know, cut it up, you know, get some, you know, there's uh, plenty of suppliers out there that make parts, you know, or, you know, do it, do it the way I do it. Go get a lathe, go get some, you know, go get some round stock, make some coil cores, you know, do the damn thing, you know, making machines is cool. You know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can make them and you can make them a work of art or you can make them just, you know, the, you know, you could just follow a very utilitarian uh, sort of style and just like all it does is, you know, you know, put, uh, put pigment in the skin. I, uh, you know, I'm all for it. I love building tattoo machines and I think you should too. That's it. Tone. Yeah. Just to roll back to what you were, you asked before, Lauren, um, you were talking about how it, like people have access to the information now, like in faraway places. And, and I had, uh, I'd mentioned this guy on Instagram and I, I can't, I can't enunciate the name. I don't want to um, destroy it, but it, he's in Indian Asia. And this is one of the, one of the guys that I follow that, that I've seen lately that has just been crushing um, handmaids. So I'm just going to put that up there real quick. I don't know if you guys can read that. Can Back up a little. Oh, yeah, there we go. I could text yeah. it over to Lauren. But, yeah, I check out his stuff. It's at, at Duraja Tats Machine. Yeah. Tony, if you spell it out for me real quick, I'll pull it up. Yeah, I, I really dig his stuff. It's it's something that's really stuck with me. Like you're talking about people far away. Like it, it's really cool now to be on Instagram and see stuff just coming out of nowhere. And this one, this guy in particular has caught my eye because I've always been a big fan of this, the, the, the Waters C-frame. And it's A-D-I-T-D-I-R-A-D-J-A-H underscore t-a-t-t-s dot machines yeah and if you scroll down man you could see like this dude's from indianesia and he's hand making these frames like it like we all do but you could see why i can relate to him because i, I build the like the raw but it, it's really cool to see like somebody on the other side of the world just like it, crushing these wagners and crushing these these j frames and these waters replicas and they're just they're fantastic yeah yeah man people are building dude it's it's cool it's cool to see people building cool shit too yeah like i i really dig what he's doing here i really do well, it's, yeah it's crusty the homie's doing it that's what's up that's a tribute like that, that's a tough that's a tough look man like you gotta you gotta look at that i know it's the picture if you had it in your hand you'll know but dude's banging them yep. so yeah that's one of the examples like to back to the question you were asking me lauren about how the information's out there now and people are reaching it and so i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of fantastic builders on here i mean i wouldn't mind getting this guy on here and bullshitting a little bit no i don't so I could reach out. Um, awesome. Yeah, we got we got three minutes. Going to wrap it up. I'd like to thank everybody who jumped on here. Um, 
if if you like the podcast, let let Lauren know, let Gabe know, let Guy know. See if uh, you want me and Greg to come on. If you want to be a guest on here, reach out to uh, reinventingthetattoo.com or me or Greg. I'm at Tony Urbanic on Instagram or at uh, T Urbanic Machines on Instagram. Um, I also own Inka Dinka Do Tattoo Studio in Pittsburgh, PA. Email is Tony Urbanic at Comcast.net. That's a lot of contact stuff. So you know where to find me. Google me. You want to be on here. You want to jump in and bullshit. You're more than welcome. Um, I'd like to thank Guy. I'd like to thank Lauren and Gabe. Um, yeah. And until next time, Greg, Lauren. Peace. Peace. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Machine thumb.